Okay, so welcome everyone to the final uh, competition for the 3MT, for the virtual 3MT, as uh, thanks to all those that are returning from this morning and, and welcome to all new attendees. Um, for those of you not familiar with the 3MT format, the basic idea is that uh, students are given three minutes to present their research. There's one static slide and it's supposed to be um, for a general lay audience so that anyone could uh, be able to understand it, not just uh, someone in their technical field. We have five finalists with us today. Um, they will give their presentations. Um, again, three minutes for the presentation. We'll have a short gap. I'll ask some questions to give the judges a little bit of time to do their scoring. And then at the end, um, hopefully we're gonna try and figure out a way to do this. A, 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 People's Choice Award that we're hoping to give it, give out. So Jen is trying to figure out how to actually get uh, information from everyone with their vote. Um, and then afterwards, the judges will uh, go to a separate room to deliberate. Um, so without further ado, um, looking at my sheet. Um, so it looks like, who's first? Looks like Dong Hyuk is first. Correct. So, Okay, so let's see. Uh, so I'm trying to, I did this this morning. Um, <laughs> all right, so I should be able to, so he's unmuted. I'm not getting the spotlight. Oh, here so I've got him. All right, I think I, I think I have it. No. Oh, I can't start my video. Yeah, right. Let me. Uh, Okay. Let me see. Um, okay. Does that work now? Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's see. So then spotlight for everyone. Okay. And then Jen just needs to get your slide up and we'll be ready to go. All right. Okay. All right. Can everyone slide oh. okay? Yeah, I think we're good, Jen. So whenever you're ready, just go ahead and, and go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, this is Donio. I'm a PhD candidate in finance department. I am very thrilled to have my three minute thesis presentation on corporate social responsibility and corporate pension plans here in front of you all. In the US, many corporations provide retirement benefits to their employees through defined benefit pension plans, just like Oregon Public Service Retirement Plan does to the plan participants, for example. Although corporate pension plans should be managed properly for the post retirement welfare, there are some serious issues around pension policies. First, corporate managers can use pension assumptions to manage. Specifically, pension costs are offset by assumed returns on pension assets. So if the returns are set high, they offset the pension costs heavily, reducing the cost amount reported on income statements. And managers, such as CEOs, choose the assumed returns. And needless to say, Earnings manipulation degenerates the reliability of a financial reporting, bringing a huge confusion to the society. Also, there is a conflict of interest between shareholders and pension members regarding pension asset management. Pension assets must be invested to grow. If a company has too much risk asset in pension asset investment, in good times, due to the good investment performance, the company does not need to make a huge contribution to the pension plan paying out dividends to shareholders with the save the money. In bad times, however, only the pension members suffer due to the insufficient pension assets caused by bad investment performance. Over the last two decades, corporate social responsibility has been an important part of US funds operations. CSR is fundamentally about social goodness that companies do to bring welfare to the society and a broad range of stakeholders. So I ask whether socially responsible firms engage in earnings manipulations through aggressive pension assumption and whether they manage pension assets in the interest of plan participants. 
by measuring form level CSR performance with ESG ratings, I find that indeed socially responsible firms have significantly less assumed returns, so they are not likely manipulate earnings, and that these firms safely manage pension assets in favor of a plan participants rather than shareholders. Still, there's a long way to go for U.S. corporations since the total number of U.S. firms that publish annual CSR report is just less than a half of the number of U.S. public firms. So policymakers should raise the importance of CSR to limit earnings manipulations and to protect the welfare and interest of plan participants. Thank you. Great, thanks for your, for your presentation. So I'm going to uh, switch up my questions from this morning a little bit so that okay. uh, we have a little bit of a, a different uh, icebreakers here. So again, uh, keeping things uh, fairly light at this point, um, I, I wanted to get a sense of, 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 of your interest. So um, maybe you can tell me within Eugene, what is your favorite local business? Could be a restaurant, could be a shop, whatever it is. There's some place that you like to go within your Eugene. In Eugene, um, I guess um, the agriculture business is much room to grow in in Eugene. So I personally um, um, go to local orchards, local farms to pick up berries, fruits every year, every summer, every fall uh, with my family. And I think even though there are many farms already in New Zealand, um, still there's a room to grow right. in the business. And so now, now another uh, lighthearted question. Uh, any recommendations for favorite uh, media that you've watched or read or anything, TV show, movies, books, something that, that is, has resonated with you in this, this pandemic period? Oh, uh, well, I'm from South Korea, but <laughs> I was not a big fan of K-pop. But recently, a uh, boy group, BTS, um, recently has released a new song called Butter. I had a chance to listen to this song, and I think that song is pretty, pretty hot. And I hope everybody enjoys the music and love K-pop culture. <laughs> okay. Great. Great. Thanks for the recommendation. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, we're gonna go on to the next. Thanks, for, thanks so much for your uh, for your presentation. So thank you here. So I think I'm going to. Uh, oh, do, do, do. Play spotlight. Sorry, I think I just spotlighted myself. Uh, sorry, uh, now I have to find there's fewer people. Uh, I think Jamila is a. Uh, Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, spotlight for everyone. I think when uh, so as soon as Jen gets the slide up, I think you'll be ready to go. All right. Can you see the screen? Okay. The slide. Yep. So whenever you're ready, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's Jamila, PhD candidate in environmental sciences and geography. Impact of climate change, especially temperature, uh, plays a critical role in shaping the vegetation, fire history, and lake productivity. So I'm working on Gold Lake, one of the most productive lake in the Pacific Northwest, to reconstruct temperature change, vegetational patterns, and lake productivity for the last 15,000 years. You can see the picture of the Gold Lake on the top left. Uh, to answer my questions, I'm using the lake sediments because the lake sediments helps to interpret the past environmental conditions based on the information which is stored in the sediment profile, including fossilized pollen and fossilized uh, midges. Now, these proxies not only provide the information about the changes that occur within the lake, but also in their surroundings. So the response of these two proxies is interestingly different from each other in terms of the time and scale. So a multi-proxy approach is vital to have a complete picture of community ecology, you know, by emphasizing how they are responding to the climate change. 
Now, when we talk about the fossil pollen, the fossil pollen data help us to understand the relationship between the past vegetation and the climate change as a direct and indirect proxy. While on the other hand, uh, the fossilized uh, midges head capsules, uh, you can use them uh, to reconstruct the temperature quantitatively because they are very sensitive to a climate change. So if there is a slight change in the temperature, you can easily determine with the help of their distribution and abundance pattern. Now, the question that I'm trying to answer using this data is I'm trying to see how have the terrestrial vegetation and the aquatic midges they have responded uh, over the period of 15,000 years and to the major volcanic eruptions, especially the Mount Mazama, the, the, Loud, the Loud Rock eruption and the Sisters eruption in the Pacific Northwest. And along with that, I'm trying to see how has the lake and uh, wa uh, lake water and air temperature has been changed. Is there uh, kind of uh, the vegetation and the aquatic uh, changes are in equilibrium with the climate change or kind of they are slightly shifted from the main route? Now, when we talk about the broader impact of my research that I'm doing, uh, this is the first ever attempt to use the coronamids, uh, the midges, which is called its midges, to quantitatively reconstruct temperature in the Oregon. And this will fill the gaps um, uh, to answer the questions that cannot be answered uh, using a single proxy. So that's why I'm using a multi-proxy approach. And secondly, the response of the terrestrial vegetation and aquatic ecology to disturbance events, especially the volcanic eruptions and the temperature change can be determined with the help of the Gold Lake course because of its unique characteristics, having the pre and post Mazama record and different volcanic eruptions. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thanks for your, uh, your excellent presentation. So again, on the light, a little bit on the lighthearted side, um, what are your favorite places to do businesses in Eugene? Again, it could be a restaurant, could be a shop, anything. Like, where do you like to, where, where, where do you support in Eugene? I love to go to the Saturday market. Mm -hmm. uh, although it's a little bit expensive, but um, I, I just try to get some stuff from there because it's really good to see how the people are working on their own. They are having these small businesses and bringing stuff on your, you know, at this place. This is like, um, something that reminds me of uh, the Saturday market we have back in my hometown. So I really like to go, even if I cannot buy something, but I love to go and see around those, you know, uh, diverse people and, you know, the diverse of the stuff you can find at one place. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love going there too. Um, and then my other question is, do you have any recommendations for books, movies, TV shows, things that have kept you entertained over the pandemic period? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. I'm a music lover, so uh, I can read and uh, write you know, six languages. So I love to listen in uh, Urdu, English, Persian, Arabic. So it's kind of uh, moving around these uh, four, five different languages. So it gives me, I mean, kind of some energy to me. I don't know, whenever I feel like down and I, if I listen to music, it feels like I'm recharging myself. So I will definitely uh, recommend to listen to your favorite music, maybe if you are in, if you are a music lover. So it, it really gives you some energy. I don't know. Maybe it's a case specific. No, no, that's fantastic. I, I think music. Yeah. I, yes. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. OK, uh, we're going to go on to the next speaker here. Uh, which is Taylor. So. Okay, uh, uh, spotlight, whoops, sorry, uh, remove spotlight. Okay, so just need Jen to get up your slide and we should be good to go. All right, perfect, thanks Jen. So whenever you're ready. All right, thanks. A remarkable thing about being human is this rich sense of self that we all experience, this ability to think about who we are and what defines us as a person. But we're also constantly surrounded by other people, and we're always thinking about who they are and why they do the things that they do. But how do we form these conclusions about these other people or these perceptions that we have of them? Are we using generalizations and stereotypes to do this? Or are we instead trying to see these other people through our own lens in a way? 
accepting that if they're like us, that they may act like us or be like us in a certain way. Now, I wanted to know what was going on inside the brain when people were engaged in these social kinds of thought processes. I wanted to know how our perceptions of these other people were formed and whether those perceptions that we have of other people may be similar or different to the perceptions that we have of ourselves. And I wanted to know whether it was important who that other person was or what the social relationships were in these small groups that we were studying. So in this small social network, for example, does it matter that Terrell feels like he's very similar to Aaliyah or that Rosa and Claire are really good friends? Does it matter that Sam and Jennifer know each other really well or like each other? Now, we brought 20 groups into the lab, uh, coworker groups, friend groups, academic groups, and one at a time, we brought each person in and we scanned their brain while they were either thinking about who they were or while they were thinking about who one of these other members of their group were. And we found something really interesting. We found that it does matter who this other person was that they were thinking about and that the social relationships that were embedded in these small groups that we were looking at were a driving force in how our perceptions of ourselves are similar to our perceptions of these other people. So if Terrell truly feels like he is similar to Aaliyah, then the activity in Terrell's brain when he's thinking about who he is, his sense of self, is very similar to the activity in his brain when he's thinking about who Aaliyah is. Evidence that Terrell may be using his self-concept in a way to try to understand Aaliyah because he feels like Aaliyah is like him. And we found the same thing for knowing and for friendship, such that higher degrees of knowing and higher degrees of friendship were associated with higher degrees of similarity between someone's representation that they had of themselves and the representation that they had of these other people. And this was especially pronounced in regions we know to be involved in social cognition, like regions listed here in this picture. And this is really important to know because it shows us that if we feel like we're like someone or that we are close to them, that we may be accepting them into our self-concept in a way. But that when the opposite is true and we feel like we are not like those other people or that we don't know them, that in cases like this, we may instead be turning to generalizations and stereotypes. And this could be fueling the toxic divides that we see in our country and around the world today. Thank you. Great, thanks so much for sharing <clears throat> your research. Uh, so again, I'll go to the lighthearted questions. Do you have uh, any recommendations for a favorite Eugene businesses that you like to frequent? Yeah, it's uh, it took us three years to actually find it, but uh, Market of Choice is like the best supermarket in the world. Uh, my wife and I both have celiac disease, so we can't eat gluten, and I've never seen so many gluten-free options on the shelves before. Uh, and, and like Jamila said, the Saturday market is also fantastic. Just whole foods, our son eats us out of house and home. So yeah, that's, it's interesting. I have, uh, I have nieces with celiac and when my sister came to visit, she couldn't like, she's coming from New York and the choices <laughs> in Eugene were like far exceeded. Yeah. We are way ahead of it <laughs> 10, 15 years ago. Um, so my other question is, uh, about, uh, you know, what, what's gotten you through other than visiting the Saturday market, any form of media, music, movies, TVs, books? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm really into to podcasts and audiobooks. Uh, podcasts that I, I absolutely love. I think everybody would enjoy uh, Hardcore History. Uh, Dan Carlin, uh, fascinating stuff. Kind of digs into a lot of these really important moments in history and just has a really, really unique narrative style. Great. No, I appreciate that. Uh, always looking for new podcasts, although. I can't listen to them all. I just don't have time. Um, okay, well, thanks so much. And we're gonna jump ahead to the next speaker. So thanks for sharing uh, your work. So Ali is next. Uh, oh, there, okay. Uh, Okay, so whenever you're ready. Hi, I'm Ali and I'm a first term graduate student at the Department of Computer Information Science and my advisor is Professor Humphrey Shi. My area of research is mainly computer vision, which means I focus on training computers to understand images. 
basically we design models which are essentially sets of mathematical functions with lots of variables and then we pass lots and lots of images through and try to optimize those variables think of it as points being plotted and trying to find a function that will pass those points essentially fitting curves essentially a model will see images and train on images and convolutional neural networks are such models and research around them has grown since 2012. There are papers they get over 50, 60,000 citations uh, and they're everywhere now. Your smartphone's camera probably recognizes faces, puts boxes around faces, adjusts face quality, overall image quality, and may even improve it further after you snap a picture. Each of these is probably a small convolutional neural network at work or as we call them CNNs. Uh, when you view your photos in your gallery app, you, see, you can see them divided into categories automatically based on subject or objects in, in the image. And in certain apps like Google Photos, you can even search for particular objects or things and it'll find photos that you've previously taken with those objects. So long story short, CNNs are everywhere and these are just very few handpicked uh, applications of CNNs. Uh, and since 2017, when researchers at Google introduced a new model called transformers, researchers have been trying to apply those models to vision because their primary application is in language processing and language models are usually big. Therefore, transformers were designed big. And by big, I mean the, the number of those variables that we need to estimate. And of course, bigger models are much more capable but require much more data and not to forget much more processing power. And to be specific, Models are usually trained on special hardware and bigger models need more advanced hardware and lots of power and lots of data. But what does an average grad student have to do to do research? Uh, compute power is expensive, data is hard to come by. There are certain areas of research where we do not have as much data. And that's what we tackle with our latest paper. We introduce compact transformers, which are small and efficient transformer models that are suitable for small sets of data. And yes, they compete head to head with CNNs. Our model enables all researchers with any kind of compute power and limited data to train transformer models and thus escaping the big data paradigm in computer vision. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to uh, thank my co-authors at Chi Lab and our preprint is also available. You can just Google compact transformers. Great, thanks for uh, sharing your work with us. Um, so I'll ask you the same question, which is, Favorite, you, I know you haven't been there here that long, uh, so maybe putting you on the spot, but if you discovered any favorite things, that, you know, uh, venues in Eugene. Uh, I actually, uh, I haven't discovered any place in particular other than I got a haircut yesterday at Amber's Barbershop on 17th and, and, and I really, I really loved it. Like it was a really great experience. Yeah, that, that's great. I know many of us have not been to a, uh, hair salon or barbershop in quite some time. Um, and, and my other question is, uh, you know, what's gotten you through the, the pandemic, uh, social, but any kind of media, books, movies, podcasts, anything really? I've actually tried a number of different things, but the, the one thing that, uh, I read a book uh, exactly when the pandemic hit, like right at the beginning. Uh, I suddenly had all this free time. Uh, I was about to graduate, so uh, classes were temporarily uh, closed. There, were, there wasn't any online solution at the time. And, uh, um, and I read this book called The Ringmaster's Daughter. And uh, it's, a, it's a really great novel. I really enjoyed it. Great. Thanks for the recommendation. And again, thanks so much for, for sharing your, your research with us. Thank you. So we're gonna go on to our uh, last speaker. Second here. Okay, remove from spotlight. Save it, spotlight. Okay. So now looking good. Okay. That's fantastic. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Andy. Yep. So whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay, I'm just gonna set my timer. A big question in educational science is how we can better support school teachers and educators in their delivery of instruction that leads to students gaining the skills and content knowledge for finding success in life. My program of research focuses on early numeracy or the mathematics that we learn in kindergarten and 
how we can give teachers the tools that they need to foster success for our youngest mathematicians. As adults, we typically take these early numeracy skills for granted, but we know that they're so important because a solid foundation in math skills and knowledge acquired in kindergarten is predictive of later academic success. And more broadly, numeracy is a life skill that's essential for individuals to be able to make better informed decisions and think critically about the presented information. Early success predicts later success, right? So we wanna build the best solidest foundation possible. In that, we know that a good example of building that foundation is the Roots Kindergarten Math Intervention, where educational experts provide on the ground, in-person training and coaching to teachers who then deliver 50 lessons of high quality instruction in kindergarten math topics like counting, addition and subtraction, and composing and then decomposing numbers into their tens and ones in place value. The pandemic that we're living through right now offered an opportunity to test whether or not educators found remote online training and coaching for Roots as effective, and in turn, if remote online training for teachers still led to improved math skills for kindergartners that are comparable to when we trained educators in person before all this pandemic began. This is a research line that directly addresses the replication crisis that we're facing in the social sciences right now, where researchers rightly point to the need to replicate findings to strengthen the robustness of the interventions that we provide. For example, we know that the ROOTS program worked from previous research years ago, but does that finding remain cons consistent when we intentionally manipulate a key variable, in this case, in-person versus remote or online training and coaching of teachers? This research study is live and the preliminary results are promising and point to remote online support as acceptable and feasible for teachers and educators. Yeah. Despite Zoom fatigue, an online format for training and coaching can work for a program like Roots in the current context. This initial outcome prompts further questions about scaling up this format of teacher support, as well as the sustainability of this approach being preferable over the in-person training and coaching, which can be costly and logistically challenging. As further results come in, I hope to share our success in helping educators build knowledge and resiliency in the young mathematicians within a research replication context. Thank you so much. Great, David, thanks so much for, for sharing. So I'll, I'll ask you, what favorite businesses in Eugene, places you like to frequent? Yeah, I've, I've been lucky to hear a few different answers and I concur with all my fellow <laughs> 3MT presenters. Um, I found that Hirons is a store like I've never seen anywhere else. I only discovered it probably partway through my first year and I am still amazed every time I walk in. And then to be a true Pacific Northwester, I have to say that um, both Run Hub uh, and like backcountry gear, amazing if you wanna be in the outdoors in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, I get uh, lost in Hirons. <laughs> Um, and then my other question is, uh, you know, what's gotten you through this time, books, movies, anything that in, in that category that you can- Yeah, see? so um, I'm uh, a big fan of academic Twitter. It really, uh, I think, is both a mental health support and also a uh, uh, productive <laughs> way to distract myself. And in academic Twitter, um, there's a lot of memes from Schitt's Creek, which is a show that I just started, or I had started watching during the pandemic on Netflix, and I would highly recommend. I, I think it's Eugene and Dan Levy, uh, Canada at their finest. Okay, thanks for the recommendation. All right, so that concludes our uh, presentations for today. Um, and I wanna thank everyone, I wanna thank the speakers. I also wanna uh, thank and acknowledge the judges um, who will be um, doing the, the hard work next, which is uh, Elliot Berkman from Psychology, uh, Jessica Price from General Counsel, uh, Stephen Stolp from Services for Student uh, Athletes, and Camilla Mortensen from the Eugene Weekly. And um, Jen, uh, do yeah. you, were you able to? So again, our, our technology may not quite do what we're wanting to, but I what we're going to do for the People's Choice Award, and only folks that are attendees as part of the 3MT are able to vote for our People's Choice Awards, um, I have tried when I push the Q and A button. I don't see how I can pose a question. Do you, Andy? No, it's weird because it it comes up with the ability to look at questions. Uh, no, but I don't see how I. Yeah. 
So I'm afraid that we may have to go rather old school, which is I could give folks my email address. And if yep. they'd like to email me their choice, um, who they vote for, for the People's Choice Award for the 3MT, um, I would be happy to tell you those. My email is jen, J-E-N, M, B at uoregon.edu. So again, my email address is jen, J E N M B at uoregon.edu. You can, oh, wait, Sarah somehow. Oh, Sarah. Wait, how did you do that, Sarah? You can get people to put in their book as a question. But how do we, we don't, well, all we need, we need to post a link. How did you do that? I'm going to try it. I posted a link, but I don't know if it worked. Oh, maybe, I think it did. So if folks are able to, they can click this link that I answered Sarah's question. Um, <laughs> and then they will, it'll go to a, um, a anonymous Qualtrics form and it just lists each of our five finalists and you can vote and then it will um, work that way. But so, if the Qualtrics okay. form does not work for you, you're also able to email me. Problem, Jen, is I can't, it's not text that I can, that. it looks like it's just. Um, you can see it, but it's not hyperlinked. Not, Mine hyperlinks, like I can yeah, yeah. it. So why don't, we, why don't we stick with, so Jen just put her email address up there. Just send her an email uh, with your vote for the top um, and we'll tally it from there. Okay, and I would just say if people could um, email me their votes by 240, um, that would be great, just so I have time to tally and let our finalists know. So I want to, again, thank everyone for coming. Thanks to the judges. Thanks to the presenters. Thanks for the attendees. And a special thanks to Jen for putting all this together. Uh, there was tons and tons of work behind the scene. And uh, unlike in-person stuff, if you don't have technology set at the very end, it's, <laughs> it can be very stressful. But, but thank you, Jen, for, for all oh, your work you. on this. And um, uh, we'll call this session to an end. And judges, don't forget to go into your uh, breakout room or your, your separate Zoom session. Um, and you can work with Sarah on getting the uh, finalists picked. So thanks a lot, everyone.